far the most crowded. So I, I thought as we would get further down the road that we would see fewer people. So this is this is very good. Uh, we also have a board member with us, Lynn Reese. Lynn, thank you for coming. Uh, today we want to talk about relationship-based care. And uh, we do appreciate your attention. We'll, for those of you standing, uh, I'll stand with you, if that's any consolation. <laughs> but the issue is, this is an introduction to a model of care and, and it's important that we don't make this more complicated than it is. And for those of you who've been in the industry a long time, you'll, this is very familiar. Relationship-based care it is nothing more than a simple way to care for our patients. It is built on an infrastructure, and we'll get into some of what that looks like as we go through this over the next 30 minutes and give you some sense of uh, assurance that this isn't the flavor of the month, it's not something that we've created to harass you uh, or to make things more complicated. It's simply a visit to what's logical. Our intent is never to be the largest healthcare provider in this region. That's not necessary. We want to be the best at what we do. And in healthcare, best, there are contributing factors that may be technology based. It's nice to have the technology. But what differentiates a healthcare provider from being okay to being the best lies in its ability to care. So today is simply to align ourselves as an organization on what that means. So first question, how many have been already involved in detailed discussions over the last six months regarding relationship-based care? How many? Two? Is that all? Okay. How many have heard the term? Okay. A bit more. How many have not heard anything about it? Good. I got some honest people here. So, at the end of today, which is at this point an introduction, what we want is everyone here to at least be familiar with what the term means and what has been done so far, and a hint of what the future looks like as we. Uh, continue to develop the culture here that supports you in the delivery of your function and your service and how it ties together for us as a total organization. That's when it really works. That's when we, without a shadow of a doubt, can say we're the best. And it's nothing more complicated than coordinating the level of care we provide. So, what do we want to do today? Define what it means, so that at least you can, if someone asks you, do you know what relationship-based care is, you can say, yeah, I've heard about it. Then we also want to create a shared vision. You'll see how important that is as we go through this, as to all of us at least having to start a shared vision of what this means. And it gets, as you'll see, it's based on relationships that start with each of us internal. Are we, as a, am I as an individual, <coughs> satisfied with what I do and how I do it? Am I, am I working in an organization that supports my commitment to caring for our patients? <coughs> Only you can answer that question. But then as you can accept that and understand that, then we look to your colleagues, your co-workers. Those in every function that we do is important that we know and understand what that means and that we trust each other <coughs> 
to help as we go forward. Then we look at the impact it has on our community, but most importantly on our patients and their families. If we take care of ourselves, our patients and their families are going to do very well. <coughs> so, today, we're going to just give you some background. You have, I'm hoping each of you have a handout that describes at least the steps we're going through. Make notes. Uh, at the end of it, we'll have a question where you can ask questions, get clarification. But please understand, don't make it any more complicated than it is. We're going to define an organizational structure that allows you to care and work together in delivering a level of care to our patients and their families that will allow us to be the best at what we do. So, one thing to remember, everyone in every department is critical to the success of this model of this culture, of this commitment on our part to deliver the best. It creates a caring and healing environment that is difficult to describe on paper, but you feel it. And that's really the important part of what we want to achieve here and the detail it takes to make that work. It's the center of everything that we do. So let's put it in simple terms. When we care for ourselves to start with, we can then care for our colleagues, our co-workers, those that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, some directly, some indirectly. But no matter what you do any, anywhere in this organization, you have an important impact in our ability to deliver the care everybody working together. So we have a good relationship with ourselves and our co-workers. Then we begin to look at how do we translate that into the relationship that we have with our patients and their families. The healing feeling starts with us. And a truism at the bottom of this slide is people don't Patients don't always remember what we did. They do remember how we made them feel. So it's important that we also understand the value of that added touch of what it takes for us to provide that best environment. Now, not so much right at the moment, but I want you to think about this as we go forward. Again, today is introduction. A lot's been done that we'll get into a little bit of detail about, but more to come as we go forward in structuring our organization to support this. What do you think that relationship-based care means for you personally? And I challenge you to ask that question as we go through this and as we proceed going forward. What does it look like? What does it look like organizationally, but also what does it look like for you and the job that you do? What should it feel like? So much of caring is feeling. What will it take to be successful? What do you see as some of the barriers? Now, this is a question I usually ask the group. What are some of the barriers that you see that could be things that we need to deal with as we go forward with a culture as I have described. What are some of the barriers? Your time is rushed. <coughs> if you're seeing patients and you've got, you know, 10 you've got to get to and your day is running on, right. you're not spending time with those patients as you should. Exactly. So, it's having the Roll the definition and the environment supporting the care, right? So some changes have been made, but not, uh, we're just in the early stages of that journey in creating that environment that allows you to spend the time doing what you do, regardless of what you do, 
for the nurses, it's with the patient. Uh, Dorinda's not with us at the moment. She had an obligation that she's going to be coming in late. But one of the things that she says is when you walk on the floor, all too often you see a crowd at the nurses station around computers. Where are the patients? In the room, in the bed. So what can we do organizationally to allow the caregivers more face time with that patient and their family? And it's not something that is nursing driven, it's everybody. In order to clarify the roles, structure the work environment to support each other, then allows each of us to do our job better. And in the case of that nurse with that patient, it's having the environment to support taking real care of that patient as opposed to running in four or five different directions all at once. Now another obstacle that has been brought up on several occasions as I, we pose this question is the resistance to change. Because as an organization, you know, if I were to go and talk to with, with all 1,100 employees, I suspect I would find clearly the majority saying, yes, I do care. But how's that translated into working together? That's what we want to achieve as we go forward, is the ability for all of us to care, to deliver the service that we're here to do, and work together in providing that best level of care for our patients and their families. So role clarification, cleaning up things. One of the concerns I've heard is that there was a NERC. We've done uh, geographic assignments. We've shifted uh, patients from one floor to another. Now for me, two east and two north don't tell me anything. Progressive care and med surge does. Because I've come from outside and that's the more familiar terms with care. A translation, that's part of it, can be very, very simple. And the, the better we are at the simple things, the better we will be as we get more complex. So, be thinking about this, but also, it requires us, each individual, to change. Change the way we think. Change the way we do business. Challenge the situation that requires you to do things that is, are interfering with your ability to provide that care. And have an environment that's receptive to that. That's the key to the deal. Now, in your handout, and I uh, encourage you to take this with you, spend a little bit more time. I don't want to go through and read all of the fine print. But the visuals here start to tell the story that it's one thing to talk about caring, it's another to provide an environment that allows you to care together. Doesn't happen by accident. And if we leave it to the wind, it'll flow in a variety of different directions, as it has been. And that's normal. But we're going to rise above what's normal to a point where we as an organization can work better together. So the core of the healing environment is your relationship to yourself, to your colleagues, to your teammates, and to your patient and family. Included in this infrastructure is things like shared governance. The goal is for we will have a we already have had, and we will continue to form work groups that are at least over half composed of those of you doing the work. It cannot be done in isolation. It must be done by those of you doing the work, creating a work environment that allows you to participate in making decisions that affect how you do your job. 
for those of you who may have been in the uh, classroom here in months past, when we first started this journey six months ago, we saw different color stickies on the wall. That was the result of several work teams dissecting how we deliver care. And it was amazing, the red stickies were those areas that there was an obstacle that prevented us from doing it the way it should be. And that exercise allowed us to clear up some things that were obstacles but were not viewed as such. One of the comments from a nurse that I understand early on was that she now had to go home to get her exercise because she was geographically assigned and not running up one side of the hall and down the other trying to find supplies, find, trying to treat the patients in a way that required far more traveling than face time with the patients. That's just a simple example of what can be done differently. So what you see here are pieces of that infrastructure that are being developed. You will be an integral part of that as we go forward. That's the purpose for this introduction, is to get you engaged with at least understanding why. And that there is a real reason for us to do this. Why relationship-based care? That's a big, big term. Because it does give positive outcomes for all three of those relationship groups. It allows us to work closer together. It allows us to spend more time doing what we need to be doing in order to support each other in the delivery of care. One of the th things, I've been in the business a lot of years and I got out of it several years ago to pursue a different uh, industry. After five years, and during that period of time, I had my own business, and, you know, I've, I've missed what I missed, was working with colleagues that are committed <coughs> to above and beyond every day. Those of us in healthcare are here for reasons other than just the paycheck. I don't want to de-emphasize the importance of the paycheck. you got to have it, and it needs to be healthy. But those that have been in the industry for a while have made that commitment. There's a piece of masochism in you because you do things above and beyond what normal people would do because you care. You're committed to making a difference in the lives of those that we serve, but also those that serve with you. This is a special industry. There are some industries that don't allow you to care. Some will allow you to care. Some require you to care. Healthcare requires you to care. If you don't care, you don't care about yourself, you don't care about your colleagues, you don't care about the patients or families, you won't be successful in this business. It's far too demanding otherwise. And you do get that feel-good days. I mean, I've worked enough with those in the industry, even myself, that I'm kind of a bit away from the front lines. But you can come away going, wow, you know, I saw that patient three days ago come in near death, and they're walking out today. And, and it doesn't matter what that outcome is. It's so important that what we do <coughs> is care. And that be so evident throughout everything we do. Some of the more touching letters that I've received over my career come from families that have lost a family member in the hospital. But the message being, 
Wow. As tough as that experience was, we felt cared for. Our loved one was cared for. And we as the family going through the anxiety and the loss felt cared for. And in the midst of such a tragedy, it was so evident, and I've received several since I've been here. Not many, thank God, but enough to know that we have a special team here, and it's a matter of us as a total organization coming together and supporting each other more in that role. Relationship-based care. You care about yourself, you care about your co-workers, all of a sudden now you have teamwork at every phase of what we do. Now we have individuals in this organization that are in the hospital. We have them in clinics, you know, outlying areas. We have them in outside buildings that are not connected with the hospital physically. But we're all part of that family or that team that's committed to making the care of our patients <coughs> special. So it doesn't matter where, we're all still part of that same team. If we work together as a team, it's much easier to get the excellence in that patient-centered care. Staff satisfaction. If you don't feel like you're stretched all over the place with interfering types of priorities, or obstacles, you can totally focus on what you're doing, your satisfaction and the team satisfaction is, is enhanced. So you improve communication, delegation, collaboration, that's all ingredients of teamwork. Now what do patients really want in this day and time? We have the opportunity to work with patients from birth to death and everything in between. We have the privilege of being able to work in an environment that truly does make a difference in the lives of those we serve. So what do patients really want? They want to be a person versus a diagnosis. And the example that you brought up earlier about running from one to the other, do you really have the time to devote to the person that you're treating? Or how about the family member? They want to be listened to, treated with respect and cared for gently. If you're scattered, if you're doing things that are not consistent with what you are there to do, you're disrupted, makes it more difficult to provide the level of care that we're talking about and that the patients want. They want care providers to respond promptly and anticipate their needs. Anticipate. So you're ahead of them. And you have the ability to accomplish that. Good communication to calm their fears. You don't come to the hospital because you feel good anymore. I can remember the days, and this dates me, where you could come in and take a physical and take three days to do it. No more. So the patients are ill. The patients are going through a challenge health-wise. And the family is going through the challenge of support and confusion. So much of today is technology-driven. I can remember the day where the hottest thing in healthcare was the single slice CT. Yeah, that was the next thing to heaven. Now it's 240 slices. 3D memo. Diagnostic ability to determine the level of care needed and the level of illness that the patient's going through. It also creates a level of confusion, and it needs translation to the family and the patient. And the caregivers are charged with that responsibility 
So what are we doing as an organization to create an environment that enhances that ability? We're now coming together. And as an organization, as I said, we have a variety of different services that are located within the hospital building. We have clinics that are involved in the care. Uh, I was reminded the other day from a member of our continuum of care team. No longer do we use the term discharge. It's now transition for the patient. Which means that we stay in touch with that patient. And that we have more opportunities to clearly send the message that we, we care enough to stay connected. To be sure that the patient, when they leave a certain service, that we help them go to the next level. If it's at home, great. We encourage and support that. If it's to another service, we facilitate that. Working together as a team, we can make that happen. We need technology and other things that we're working on to facilitate that as well. But it starts with each of us making that transition. Keeping together is progress. So after this introduction, setting the, the tone of coming together, let's make sure we stay together. And then when this is hitting on all cylinders and we're working together, we can truly see the benefits <coughs> to each individual because <coughs> Your role, your job, your service should be more clearly defined. And defined in such a way that we're helping each other better than what we've been able to do in the past because we've had to deal with a variety of different obstacles, one of which is the, our current EMR. We know that for a fact. And we're working to get that resolved. So, again, this visual further describes the infrastructure needed to support a change so that we can all say that we care, and when we define caring, we do it in such a way that it is of one month. So if you look at the visual, this is what, what this is kind of describes what's been done over the last six months. Putting together the skeleton of the infrastructure, leadership alignment, uh, change readiness assessment, because it does require a different way of thinking. It's getting the project plan de developed. Uh, uh, Yogi Berra fan have been for a long time. I remember when he was playing, and I remember watching him when he played. So, again, dating me. He's attributed to having many truisms. One of which is, if you don't know where you're going, you'll never get there. So it's important that we are able to capture this journey that we are on, capture the essence of what it means so that we can all share that and put it into plans that map out how we get there. So this isn't just a feel-good, fluff-and-puff discussion about caring. It's at the core of why we exist. But as an organization, we owe it to you and to all of us to have a structure to make sure we get there. So, in this change, First step is to align and create a shared vision. 
and I would find it probably rare to find someone who can't align with a vision of caring. And if you can align with that and get on board and believe and trust the fact that we as an organization are on this journey with you, you can get inspired, motivated, if you want to call it that, to be a part of the solution. It doesn't happen by accident, by the way. You just don't all, you know, by accident come in and care all of a sudden and everybody work together and it'd be wonderful. It doesn't happen. Not as complex as we, the business we're in, with all the moving parts, with each individual patient being individual and requiring that touch. It is complex. The better we work together, the less complex it becomes. Team, you're not alone. I know sometimes you probably feel that way, especially if you work nights, but even, they, even times during the day. But know that you are a part of a team, a team that's making a difference in the lives of those we serve. The infrastructure that we are rolling out and will continue to roll out is there. It will allow you to change. And most of the time, if it's done right and you're in on the shared vision, you won't even know you're changing because it's so logical. Education. We need to educate. We need to describe what this means. It needs to be two ways. One, is that we're part of instructing on what that infrastructure looks like. But the second side of that education is your participation, your ability to ask a question when it's confusing, your ability to say, wait a minute, have you thought about this or that? Become an active member of that. Become a piece of or a part of the education. And then, Obviously, change will occur when you see the evidence of success. It feeds on itself. Now, so that you understand the dynamics of what we're talking about, transformational change <laughs> happens one relationship at a time. If you can have that self-discussion with yourself saying, yep, I'm, I'm good, I'm on board. That's a start. Then you spread it to your colleagues, one at a time. Think of what you can do when you walk out of here that's consistent with this mission, this vision. And execute logical, basic things. <coughs> As we do that, we then project that to one patient at a time, one family, and we do it right. And as that develops, all of a sudden you've created an environment that we can as described by our patients, will be described as the best. Now, this is for your information, and it's just to kind of give you a sense that change doesn't happen by accident. I've said that before. There are certain ingredients that need to be a part of this in order for change to occur. This is important for the organization to understand because if we can't align on a vision, well, the ingredients are vision. You got to align that. Plans, you got to take that vision and reduce it to something you can see, feel, and touch. Resources, you got to have resources in place that support it. Skills, 
need to be skilled, credential, qualified to do the work that you're expected to do. And then incentives. Now, if we don't have the vision, if we can't align on that, we're going to create a level of confusion. So it's logical. This, to me, kind of helps me understand. If we're not hitting on all cylinders, where among these boxes do we need to spend more time? If we don't have the plans, if we're just talk, and we're not working with you to convert the talk to something that's real, you're going to get wasted efforts. It's back to old yoga. You don't know where you're going, you never get there, and all it becomes is empty talk. If we don't ensure that we have the resources in place, it's just going to frustrate people, and rightfully so. So as an organization, we need to be prepared. As we develop these changes, we want to be sure that each of these ingredients are included. Skills. How difficult is it for each of us to be expected to do something that we can't do because we're not skilled? That creates a lot of anxiety. And incentives. You know, incentives can come in a variety of different things. It could come as pay. It can come as benefits. It can come as a workplace environment that is positive to work in. It can come in a variety of different ways for each individual. But we have to ensure that we have incentives in place that make it worth your time. So this is just a bit of an exercise of realizing it's not just a matter of fluff and puff talk. It's got to be committed to, understood, and supported. And that's where we as an organization come in. Now, I enjoyed walking through this, and I won't walk through each individual steps, but I encourage each of you to walk through this cycle. Each of us, are, each of us is somewhere on this cycle. Because we're in the midst now of a change. We know that there's natural resistance to change because when we change the, the patient areas, the patient care floors or sections, there was a lot of angst and resistance to that. So we know that change is a part of this. So just spend a few moments quietly walking through this cycle and find out where you fit. Our commitment and our goal is to create an organization where everyone is on the upper right corner, moving forward. But to do that, you have to go through the other phases. And it's an individual type of thing. So I encourage you to, to look at it, find out where you fit. If you have questions, if for whatever reason you're depressed, reach out. Why? Why are you depressed about the changes being made? Because it's not intended to do that. So what can we do to help as an organization? Again. We have to be open, eyes, ears, minds, hearts, as we go forward with this. So just spend some time, as you can, to find out where you are and know where we're headed. And if you're not in a, on the positive side of that, ask some questions. Find out why so that we can address it. Okay. Next steps, education and training. Again, that's not that's two fancy words for just describing what we want, what we need. Two-way street, 
you describing what you want, what you need, knowing that we have a shared vision to achieve where we're headed, and that is to be the best place to receive care for our patients and their families. First, training our leaders to understand so that they do open the doors and listen to those of you providing the care. They're on the front lines, many of them, but they need your participation. As we said earlier, with shared governance, we're looking at greater than half the work teams, the work efforts, will be comprised by those on the front line providing the care. So in order to do that, as an organization, we need to educate ourselves. We need to provide the tools that help our leaders open their minds and their ears to listen. And then to the entire organization. This is step one, introduction. This is what it's all about, relationship-based care. Nothing more and doing the best job possible to care for our patients and their families and taking the time and effort to make sure we do it right. And to do that, we'll establish metrics. And what we're talking about there is how well are we doing? How, and metrics is, is a bit misunderstood term. All it is is how do we know we're being successful in what we do? There are certain ways to measure that. So, and that keeps us on track. That lets us know if we're being successful at what we're doing. It, it will let us know where we may not be as successful as we need to be. And it will allow us to pay attention to those areas that we've not yet accomplished what we want. And then monitor and adjust to the metrics. It's part of a infrastructure to be sure we stay on track. Thoughts? <clears throat> Dr. Kanda, welcome. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> I think it's a great, uh, I just saw the end of it, but I think uh, set expectations, everybody working together, set the metrics, and achieve it, right? Yep. <clears throat> so, this is all inclusive. I know that Dr. Kanda lives this. And our commitment is to provide an environment that is the best to be a patient, a family member, a practicing physician, an employee, a team member. This is achievable, and certainly we intend to get there. But we need everyone together. Now, as time goes on, as I said, this is an introduction more just to let you know. Now, I'll get back to the first question I asked. How many have at least heard about relationship-based care? Oh, I'm sorry. You not heard about it? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's nothing more, this is not something that we dreamed up in a in a lab somewhere. It's something for those that have been in the industry a long time. It's just a translation of logic. But it's a commitment across our entire organization to create this environment. So you're not going to be alone. But we need you to be a part of the solution as well. Can we do that? I'm not asking you to come up with a lot of questions today unless you want to because we certainly have the forum, but I know in large groups people are a bit hesitant to do that. We had a lady last night that asked about four different questions, and I said, I want to take her into every group so that those that are too bashful to ask will have somebody to ask the question. So, any questions? More to come as we go forward, but just know this is where we are. This will, for logical reasons, allow us to be the best.
at what we do. So an institution, a building, doesn't make you the best. You know? An OR table that's the most expensive doesn't make you the best. Your knowledge, your abilities to do the work make you better. So th th that's, that's where it is. Your ability to communicate with the patient. What we do. We don't need to do, you know, we don't need to clip aneurysms here. And those of you who were at our aneurysm meeting the other day. No, we, we don't need to do that. We just need to be able to help those patients appropriately get the care that they need. We can do community medicine here at a very high level, a very valuable level to the community and into a profitable level for the institution. And that's what we're looking to do. And everyone has to believe it, right? So. This is almost a time where we all get into a hand pump. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I think one of the things when we talk about our, our patient satisfaction it in a lot of different forums every month um, is, is, oh, well, why did this trend downward? Why haven't we been able to impact this score maybe that we wanted to impact? And, and what we've been talking about recently is that even the slightest shift in the, the compatibility of the team, the communication of the team, gets, the, the patients are aware of it. They sense it. They know when the team's broken down. So if there's, if there's if there's breakdown in the team, if an individual doesn't feel like they are able to contribute or have an unwillingness to contribute or the communication isn't high, that filters down to our patients. And, and, and just like David said, it's not necessarily all the little work, the actions that were done. It's, it's the way we made people feel. If they feel that they're not at the center of the reason we're all here, it's, it's going to impact the entirety of their state and, and influence their future decisions to receive their health care. So, so, I suspect that there are some of you going, well, okay, I do care, but how the heck can I do this wonderful new level of care given what I know today? Well, that's what we're talking about changing, is the entire environment affected by all of us. So that we remove those frustrating obstacles that keep you from doing what you are here to do and giving you an environment that supports what you do, regardless of what you, what you do. And to Manon's point, uh, many times the complaint is not involved in the clinical delivery of care. It's an offhanded <coughs> remark made coming in the building or out of the building. It can be when they receive the bill. There's a lot of complaints when they, when they get the bill. But the idea is we're all focused on the same thing, which is make it special. Yes, I can tell you that I do a good portion of the safer health calls. They get the automated calls first, and out of the people that I reach out to, some of, there's a good portion of them that they just answer the questions because they want to get off the phone. So it's like how true are their answers? And the ones that don't come to me, it makes you wonder how true are their answers. But I do get a lot of compliments, and I try to type those into the program. And I get a lot of complaints. And we try to piece them over with, you know, explain why this happened, why that happened. But we do, I can't get any more people to say, so-and-so did this for me. Everybody was great is what I usually get if they right. give a compliment. Right. So, but I am getting compliments. Not, it's not all bad. Every so often you get one that's... The nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. But as long as we know each individual patient can do what we can. <laughs> each individual person do what we can for that individual patient. Mm -hmm. And it gets back to that change occurs just one person at a time. Yes, sir. So, I think these scores on patient evaluations are great. But my, my take in my clinic or where I'm at is I don't need to wait for a, a, a evaluation of how the patient's experience is, right? You know, right there, okay? You're, you go in there, you evaluate the patient. You know, doc wasn't, you know, sometimes we're busy, right? Doc didn't spend enough time, no problem. You know, call the doctor. We all have to buy in. On this side, on that side, we all have to buy in. So right there. Every, is everything going okay? You know, check their vitals, do all the bread and butter that you need to do. But on the back side, you're still 
part of our community, right? Your brother, sister, mother, father, somebody. And you can then address them that way. Is everything going well? You feel a better? Or can we get you anything? That just little touch goes 100%. Nobody gets to walk out of my office upset. And if there's a major issue and it's just unresolvable, you're going to have those. But that's a rarity. The small piece is just make sure we don't always have medications. We don't always have surgery. We don't know. But we can give somebody our ear, give them the time, treat them with respect and dignity, listen to them, and try to make an effort. And that's all they need. It's simple. It's as simple as uh, you know the rules on the playground, right? Golden rule: do what you have done to yourself. Thank you. The, uh, any other questions? Anything? Now that I know everyone at least understands what this means, more to come. Much more to come as we go forward. Just remember, you can walk out today and make a difference, and just know that we're going to be addressing concern that you raised earlier and looking at how we do our business and how can we make it better. Centered around this, taking care of our patients in the best manner possible. That being the common theme in everything we do. Okay? Well, I know for those that have been here standing, I appreciate your attention. So, thank you.